Welcome to today's webinar on IFRS 13, CVA, DVA, EVA and the implications on age accounting, co-hosted by Deloitte and Quantify. So with the introduction of IFRS 13, the requirements for calculating complex variables, including CVA and DVA, remain. IFRS 13 has significant implications for all firms that measure financial assets at fair value. Today's webinar will explore challenges, risk factors, calculation techniques and concepts for measuring financial instruments under IFRS 13. We will also explore the implications of CVA and DVA on hedge accounting, which is oftentimes overlooked. So during the webinar, if you would like to submit a question to the presenters, please do so using the question pane on the right hand side. Today's presenters are Dr. Dmitry Bukajewski, Director of Research at Quantify, Saul Silverman and myself, Philip van Berg, at Deloitte in South Africa. So we'll start off with the challenges and implications of measuring financial instruments under IFRS 13. So IFRS 13 was, became effective on the 1st of January 2013. It establishes the single framework for giving guidance on how to measure fair value. It also clarifies the definition of fair value as an exit price and it increases the disclosure requirements. There's also a number of standards that refers to fair value which is excluded such as share-based payments and referred to on the bottom right of your screen. IFRS 13 changed the definition of fair value. Fair value is now defined as the price that will be received to sell an asset or pay to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. It also introduces the concept of an active market. So previously where a lot of emphasis was placed on a quoted market, the emphasis now on an active market which 13 defines as a market with sufficient frequency and volume to provide pricing information on an ongoing basis. So no longer can one just take a quote from a screen one also needs to determine if that market is an active market. Also the concept of a principal market which is defined as the market where it's the greatest volume and level of activity of the assets. And 13 wants you to use the principal market for financial instruments and it, only if a principal market does not exist then to move towards the most advantageous market which is defined as the market which will maximize the amount that you could receive when you, you sell that asset. But then you have to take into account transaction costs and transport costs. So some of the concepts in IFRS 13 that introduce are things like the exit price. So it's very clear now that 13 defines fair value as an exit price and, and, and now effectively requires you to take into account all factors that a reasonable market participant will take into account. And by implication, this means that one should consider credit risk, liquidity, funding costs, and things that market participant would take into account. It obviously excludes transaction costs, but it really means it's not the price at which you settle a liability or extinguish a liability or, or cancel the asset. It's really the price that you would receive when you would sell the asset. 13 also introduces new concepts around bid, mid and offer, whereas IS39 was very prescriptive, requiring assets to be at bid, liabilities to be at offer, whereas IFRS 13 gives you the option to market anywhere between the bid and the offer where you would normally transact, consistent with the exit price concept, and it doesn't preclude you from using mid market prices as a practical expedient. Another interesting concept is the unit of account. 13 wants you to determine fair value effectively estimating the price that one could receive to, to sell an asset, uh, consistent with the unit of account, which is defined as the smallest unit that can be traded. Effectively, if you've got a share, for example, and you've got a block of shares really taking price times quantity to determine the fair value of that block of shares. Now, that does bring into account a number of questions. For example, um, if you have a control stake and all of, all of those things, that sometimes the, the, the true exit price of that block of shares might be different to the price times quantity and, and that brings into account a whole, opens a can of worms. For example, for retail assets, one can always debate, is it possible to sell a single retail asset 
or should one sell a portfolio of assets or would a vintage or be, be, be able to sell. So the unit of account is actually a very important concept because once you establish the unit of account, that will then determine how you would go about to fair value that financial instrument. Other aspects are, for example, um, if we look at the third bullet there, um, the portfolio exemption. So IFRS 13 introduces this concept of a group of financial assets and effectively allows you to fair value your net exposure to an asset or liability. If there's offsetting market or credit risk, one can offset those market and credit risk and value the net exposure and then thereafter one would need to reattribute that fair value between the, the liability component and the asset component. But it does in practice open up a number of possibilities where your valuation um, basis or the way in which you value an asset can be simplified and if one can only value the net exposure and are not forced to value all the gross exposures, all the gross assets and the gross liabilities. It is however important that one needs to have this documented in, as part of your risk management strategy. The, in the way in which the information is provided to management must be on a net basis. Um, and all assets and liabilities within that portfolio must be measured at fair value under the applicable IFRS. So there's a bit of hoops to jump through, but from a practical experience point of view, this allows one to, to value net exposures more effectively. Some of the requirements of IFRS 13, some of the stricter requirements are the fair value at initial recognition. So the transaction price equals its fair value at initial recognition. This is nothing new. IS39 also had the same concept that at the origination of a deal, that deal must have been done, if done between a willing buyer and a willing seller, it is assumed to have been transacted at fair value. And 13 requires you to have any valuation technique which is based on unobservable inputs. If you build a model to try and uh, fair value a financial instrument, that model must be calibrated such that the fair value of the model gets back to where you transacted at. Um, and this ensures that the future measurement reflects only changes in value subsequent to initial recognition. So if the transaction price differs from the fair value at initial recognition, the resulting gain and loss, which is often referred to as day one P&L, must be recognized in profit and loss. So this is it's quite interesting because IFR 13 is all about an exit price and sometimes a lot of um, banks which originate financial assets will always argue that the fair value of anything they originate must be worth more than what was dispersed to a client. Um, but it is quite interesting that 13 requires you to, to effectively calibrate any valuation model back to where you transact. Third, one of the methods in which 13 is, is aiming to achieve cons transparency and comparability is through the use of the fair value hierarchy. This will require banks and market participants to classify the inputs that go into a fair value model as level one, two, or three. Level one being fully observable in an active market for identical assets. Case in point being, for example, a share that is actively traded in the market, you will simply take that share price because it is fully observable for identical assets. Level two inputs are those that are quoted but might not be within an active market. Um, also, it includes things like yield curves, implied volatilities would all fall under level two inputs. And level three inputs are truly unobservable inputs, which oftentimes are calibrated variables or variables taken from historical uh, experience, etc. cetera. Uh, Hello, uh, this is uh, Dmitry Pugachevsky. So in this part of the presentation, we will talk about different uh, fair value adjustment, CVA, DVA, and uh, new valuation adjustment, FVA. Uh, all three uh, together, they uh, compose the uh, so-called XVA, uh, the triad of valuation adjustment. So we'll start with CVA. This was the uh, first uh, valuation adjustment, which was applied 
uh, to accounting and uh, this is uh, the best understood. Uh, it's uh, CVA stands for credit valuation adjustment and um, you can define this as, as expectation of losses due to counterparty default. Uh, you can also think about this as market price of the default option sold to counterparty. Uh, as a very simplified calculation uh, based on average expected positive exposure, you can think of this as CVA's expectation of losses is 1 minus counterparty recovery multiplied by average expected exposure and probability that uh, counterparty defaults. Uh, of course, the uh, real valuation are uh, much more complex and I will talk about this a little bit later. Um, actually, uh, people started um, applying CVA even before the uh, CVA was uh, called CVA. Uh, for example, if you purchase a defaultable bond from an issuer, uh, when issuer defaults, um, you will get uh, a recovery instead of principal and all the future coupons of the bond. So uh, everyone knows that defaultable bond worth less than a risk-free bond. And uh, this PV of a riskless bond and market price of the risky bond is uh, CVA, uh, kind of original CVA. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, CVA is uh, first part of XVA um, and now that we see XVA desks, uh, there are desks which uh, trade and hedge CVA, DVA and FVA. Uh, how do they use this XVA? Uh, this is the price or upfront charge of an insurance policy against credit default related losses. Uh, you can also think about this as upfront cost of hedging entire expected exposure profile. Uh, DVA or bilateral CVA. Um, so if uh, CVA is subtracted from mark to market, if it's um, a cost um, uh, to the uh, trading, uh, then uh, DVA is amount added back to mark to market uh, due uh, to account uh, due to expected gain from own default. Uh, DVA stands for debt valuation adjustment and it is a basically CVA from the counterparty perspective. If one party incurs a CVA loss, the other party records the same uh, DVA gain. And again, if we uh, would like to uh, write some kind of uh, simplified calculation based on expected uh, now negative exposure, uh, then uh, DVA is expectation of a gain. It's 1 minus own recovery multiplied by uh, negative exposure multiplied by probability of own default. Uh, DVA is kind of controversial uh, because institutions uh, record gains when their credit quality deteriorates. We all remember like three years ago when a spread of big banks um, widened. Uh, Morgan Stanley uh, gained uh, around four billion just because of DVA. Um, and it's kind of create perverse incentives as gain only realized on default. Uh, calculating bilateral CVA, uh, which is CVA minus DVA, to do this both party basically acquire same credit adjusted mark to market value. And now the third part of this uh, cross VA um, adjustments. Um, actually, uh, when we had a webinar like two years ago, we called CVA, DVA and FVA the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, I think it still stands. Uh, FVA is kind of least understood and uh, I will talk about this um, again uh, in detail. But uh, basically this is co cost of borrowing money to finance hedging of uncollateralized trades. And uh, the, the whole uh, cross-valuation adjustment, the whole XVA uh, should be taken into account when profitability of trade is estimated. Uh, while doing this, we have to remember that CVA and FVA are costs to the bank and DVA is a benefit. Um, Quantify was actually first to market with FVA calculations back in February 2012. Uh, we wrote several papers on this topic and after much debate and many controversies, which I will uh, also describe a little bit, uh, we think market now finally settled on the defini definition of FVA and how should it should be calculated and it's consistent with our approach as well. Um, just to give a little bit more details on FVA, it's generated by two parts, FCA finding cost adjustment and FBA finding benefit adjustment. Uh, so uh, where, where this FVA really comes from? 
uh, when bank is uh, doing non-secure trade, uh, it hedges with secure trade with the riskless counterparty. And when PV of the trade, the original trade is positive, PV of hedge is negative. Uh, to pay collateral, ba uh, bank has to borrow cash at its funding rate, LIBOR plus SB. Uh, this generates FCA. Uh, the other way around, when trade value is negative, collateral call on hedging trade is generating cash, which earns LIBOR plus lending spread SL. This generate FBA. So total FV is FCA minus FBA, and this is cost to the bank. Uh, JP Morgan's FVA report was very important. Um, uh, it was uh, announced uh, in uh, January 2014, uh, the results of the last quarter of uh, 2013. Uh, the FVA was included for the first time, and more, most important, it was explained there in details. The whole slide in uh, investor presentation was uh, devoted to FVA. Um, FVA was a loss of 1.5 billion pre-tax. And in this uh, presentation, um, uh, JP Morgan explained adoption of FA in terms basically consistent with um, a definition and calculation which I just mentioned. Um, moreover, um, Chief Financial Officer uh, mentioned that um, uh, this uh, number 1.5 billion can come from receivables, net of cash and collateral around 50 billion uh, netted across the whole uh, kind of hedging set. Um, and if you apply average duration of five years and spread of 60 basis point, this will generate exactly a loss of 1.5 billion. Uh, another important thing that uh, JP Morgan mentioned explicitly, they uh, didn't take into account uh, FBA, benefits for liability, so there is no double counting uh, of DVA issue. And starting with the next uh, quarter, with the first quarter 2014, uh, JP Morgan consolidated DVA and FBA PNL, and the resulting PNL uh, was uh, basically much smaller than uh, their two um, uh, separate PNLs. It was only uh, it was below 200 million. Uh, I, I, will, I talked a little bit, uh, mentioned controversies. Um, we think that they are mostly resolved now, but I would like to mention some of them. Um, Hal White, uh, famous uh, uh, financial academicians, they started FVA debate uh, more than two years ago, where they argued that DVA and FVA, they referred to them as DVA1 and DVA2. Uh, they both depend on bank spread, and then counting both of them is adding them together is basically uh, double counting. Uh, but uh, we think now, like uh, the industry uh, settled uh, on understanding that um, basically you have to think of FVA as two separate um, uh, entity as FB and FCA, uh, and cost is and DVA are completely different. You can argue that DVA and FB are uh, benefit and DV are kind of uh, double counting, uh, but if you calculate um, FB with correct lending spread, um, then there, there will be no double counting, or you can think of this lending spread as a um, uh, basis between uh, cash and credit, for example, derivatives. Um, so then there will be no double counting. Um, uh, another point they made is that FEA shouldn't exist at all uh, because it cannot be derived using standard risk neutral assumptions like riskless funding. Uh, but again, with uh, uh, like other examples of market incompleteness, um, this um, um, non riskless borrowing creates an adjustment to theoretical price. So it's uh, perfectly normal in uh, financial uh, quantitative industry. Uh, another controversial issue with FEA can you pass FEA to counterparty? Unlike CVA DVA, which uh, everyone agrees should be included in mark to market price, there is no symmetrical part to FEA. So both counterparty uh, basically incur uh, this uh, cost. And uh, that's why they both of them are reluctant to accept this cost from the uh, counterparty. Uh, some banks still charge corporate clients for their uh, funding, and as a result, banks with higher funding spread could end up losing trades and becoming less competitive. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. So now we will look at, um, we will consider the impact of these valuation adjustments as well as OAS discounting on hedge accounting. So hedge accounting, the, the fundamental objective of hedge accounting is to ensure that the gain or loss 
on the hedging instrument or your derivative is recognized in profit and loss in the same period when the hedge item or the underlying affects profit and loss. So on the right hand side you can see that without hedge accounting derivatives will basically be marked to market, they must be at fair value and they will create volatility in P&L. They must be recognized in P&L without hedge accounting they will create volatility. So the objective of hedge accounting is really to ensure that the fair value gain or loss, the unrealized fair value gain or loss on the hedging instrument and that of the hedge item affects P&L at the same time. And mechanically the way in which hedge accounting achieves this is slightly different. So for cash flow hedges, one would take the unrealized fair value gain or loss and defer that in equity or in other comprehensive income and release it out of other comprehensive income as the underlying transaction hits P&L. So in effect, um, one would, for example, if one pay fix on an interest rate swap, one would book the interest expense on the underlying liability based on the floating reference rate and the fixed rate, the unrealized gain will be deferred in OCI and that will be reversed out of OCI to into P&L such that you, one would expense the fixed rate of the swap, provided that you're 100% effective and um, comply with all the hedge accounting requirements. That is cash flow hedging. So fair value hedging is where one would hedge out, um, for example, the interest rate risk of a fixed rate asset or liability, and one can then take one can then take that asset and liability, and even though one accounts for it at amortized cost, one can fair value it with um, relation to the designated hedge risk. And that designated hedge risk could be interest rate risk only, so it's not as if one fair values the entire asset or the entire liability, but one fair values it um, only in, in relation to changes in interest rate. And that fair value change can then be taken to P&L and that will then offset the fair value uh, movements of the derivative. However, to apply hedge accounting and to get rid of the volatility, one would need to comply with all the requirements of hedge accounting, which includes effectiveness tests. So under I39, there's two tests required, a prospective test and a retrospective test. And both of these tests need to be performed for one to comply with hedge accounting requirements. There are two methods, or there are more than two methods, but the, predominantly the dollar offset method is a method where we take the change in fair value of the hedging instrument or your derivative and express that as a ratio over the change of fair value of the hedge item for the attributable hedge risk. And that ratio then needs to be between 80 and 125%, i.e. the hedging instrument must be highly effective in offsetting the risk on the hedge item. For cash flow hedging relationships, one can replace the change in fair value of the hedge item with a hypothetical derivative. So the equation more or less stays the same, it's just that one wouldn't fair value the underlying asset, but one would um, create a hypothetical derivative. And the hypothetical derivative is effectively the derivative that perfectly hedges your designated hedge a risk. So for example, you're exposed to floating rate interest rates on an asset, if you swap that out to a fixed rate, you perfectly got rid of your cash flow risk, therefore it's a cash flow hedge, and the, the derivative that perfectly would hedge your cash flow risk is a payer swap. The, there's other requirements on the hypo that must be on market derivative, effectively saying that one cannot recognize any, it must price back to zero on day one. And those are the most important methods of testing effectiveness. There are others such as regression analysis, but the concept is, the real questions are, how should one treat CVA and DVA when dealing with hedge effectiveness? Now, for IS39, it's not prescriptive on how to incorporate credit risk in the hypothetical derivative, if at all. IFRS 13 clarifies the factors to be considered in estimating fair value. Key area where IFRS 13 provides more guidance is the inclusion of counterparty and own credit risk. With this being said, a number of questions come to mind. Firstly, must an entity consider counterparty credit risk in the evaluation of hedge effectiveness? Then, when setting up the hypothetical derivative for a cash flow hedge, should credit risk be included in determining the critical terms, including pricing, 
of the hypothetical derivative at inception of the hedge? If yes, should credit risk be updated in future periods when determining the fair value of the hypothetical derivative? Another consideration within the context of valuation adjustments is which yield curve should be used as a discount curve in setting up the hypothetical derivative. So the first question is, must an entity consider counterparty credit risk in evaluation of hedge effectiveness? So our view is yes. IS39, F43 and F47 are very clear. Non-performance risk must be included during the life of the hedge and not only at the inception of the hedge when hedge effectiveness is assessed. Basically, an entity cannot ignore whether it will be able to collect all amounts due under the contractual provisions of the hedging instrument. When assessing hedge effectiveness, both at the inception of the hedge and on an ongoing basis, the entity considers the risk that the counterparty to the hedging instrument will default. Credit risk, CBA or DBA, should be included in the valuation of the hedging instrument. This would be then consistent with IFRS 13 fair value principles. And the hypothetical derivative should be created such that all the critical terms of the swap match the underlying hedged item. A follow-up question is how should an entity incorporate credit risk in the valuation of hedge effectiveness? So by incorporating CBA and DBA in the fair value of the hedging instrument, but excluding it from the hedge item or hypothetical derivative, ineffectiveness will be calculated to the dollar offset effectiveness percentage. As there are alternative methods of excluding CBA and DBA from the hypothetical derivative, we'll address this in the next slide. Another follow-up question is how should the netting set CBA and DBA be allocated to the individual hedges? So we feel that any reasonable method is adequate. Examples of reasonable methods include marginal contribution method or weighted average proportional method with individual trade CBA DBA values as the weights. So the question is why is this relevant? Well, typically CBA and DBA are calculated based on a netting set. So we need some way of allocating the CBA and DBA down to the trade level. Pro-rating based on clean fair values is not a good idea. For example, for a long-term cost currency swap with exchange of notional at the beginning and end, training at or close to par will typically have a significant contribution to the CVA and DVA, whereas the fair value would indicate otherwise. Another challenge that arises from the FS13 impact on the way the hedge effectiveness is performed is obtaining the relevant data. An example of this is calculating the probabilities of default, which, especially in the South African context, is rather challenging given the lack of available local market data, CDSs. From our observations, banks typically use risk-neutral probabilities of default. Some banks have a threshold before applying CVA and DVA. There is a variety of observable CDS spreads trading in the market. What you've seen the banks do is back out probabilities of default from these market-traded CDSs. Given this, one can then construct one, a generic all-industry average probability of default per rating category, and average probabilities of default per sector. So therefore, given the IFRS 13 requirements to maximize usage of observable market data, our advice is to follow a waterfall structure. And that comprises of, firstly, if the counterparty has observable CDA spreads available, then use these spreads to back out the probabilities of default. Failing that, if the counterparty has liquid listed debt or has a credit linked note that references the counterparty, then the credit spread can be obtained from there. However, this might require a fair amount of effort, though it can be done. Subsequent to that, if the counterparty has a suitable proxy, then use the proxy probabilities of default. One might adjust the raw numbers if one thinks that the counterparty is slightly better or worse. If you believe a quanto adjustment is required, then perform the adjustment on the proxy. If the counterparty does not have CDS spreads available and there is no suitable proxy, but has an international local currency credit rating, then one can apply the average probability of default estimate of that rating for the counterparty. Failing that, Lastly, alternatively, one can use quasi-risk neutral probabilities of default, which can be obtained from the conversion of historical probabilities of default, using, for example, methods proposed by Moody's. The next question we have, when setting up the hypothetical derivative for cash flow hedging relationship, is an entity allowed to include credit risk, CVA and DVA, in determining the critical terms, including pricing, of the hypothetical derivative at inception of the hedge? The second part of this question is, if yes, should credit risk be updated in future periods when determining the fair value of the hypothetical derivative or hedge item? For this, there is no clear guidance. And Deloitte is of the opinion that two approaches are acceptable. The first is, no, exclude credit risk when setting up the hypothetical derivative and changes in credit risk are not included in determining the fair value of the hypothetical derivative over the term of the hedge. Alternatively, yes, 
impute credit risk assumptions when setting up the hypothetical derivative, but keep the at inception credit risk assumptions, probabilities of default and loss given defaults, constant when subsequently determining the fair value of the hypothetical derivative over the term of the hedge. So for the first approach, the fact that the counterparty can default will have a direct impact on the effectiveness of the hedge. Even when the entity is perfectly hedged for currency risk, the hedge will be completely ineffective if the counterparty defaults. In order to appropriately measure this hedging effectiveness, credit risk must be included in the evaluation of the hedging instrument but excluded from the hypothetical derivative. This first approach assumes that in order to appropriately measure this hedging effectiveness, credit risk must be included in the evaluation of the hedging instrument but excluded from the hypothetical derivative. So, for example, when setting up the hypothetical derivative, one would solve for the fixed rate using interbank mid-market clean curves. For the second approach, similar to the first approach, the fact that the counterparty bank can default will have a direct effect on the effectiveness of the hedge. However, even a hypothetical derivative should take into account that it is not economically feasible to enter into a derivative transaction assuming the entity entering the hedge has no credit risk. Under the second approach, the credit assumptions of the hypothetical derivative are kept constant when determining the fair value in future periods. In this way, the changes in credit assumptions will result in ineffectiveness. The second approach acknowledges that ineffectiveness should only arise from changes in the credit risk parameters, for example, your probabilities of default and loss given defaults, and not from other market variables driving your expected potential exposure and expected negative exposure. Due to the inclusion of credit risk in the fair value of the hypothetical derivative, there will generally be less of a mismatch between the hedging instrument and the hypothetical derivative compared to the first approach. With all else being equal, the mismatches will stem from the changes in credit assumptions. To reduce spurious ineffectiveness, our preferred approach is the second one. For our third question, which yield curve should be used as the discount curve in setting up the hypothetical derivative? Assuming an ORIS market exists, the discount curve used should follow the collateralization agreement of the hedge. So for, for one, for fully collateralized hedging relationships, use OIS curves. For uncollateralized hedging relationships, use liable curves. The argument for the OIS curve is that because credit risk is not part of the designated hedging relationship, the hypothetical derivative, which represents the perfect hedge, should use the most risk-free market observable discount curve. OIS is a more suitable proxy for the risk-free curve than LIBOR. In addition, for fully collateralized trades, a no arbitrage argument implies that CSA discounting, which is typically OIS, should apply. The arguments for LIBOR is, first, it could be argued that the perfect hypothetical derivative for the corporate is a non-collateralized trade, rather than a collateralized trade. If this is valid, then OIS discounting should not apply to the hypothetical derivative. The perfect derivative may be a perfect uncollateralized derivative, taking liable discounting into account. RIS discounting has been almost exclusively reserved for collateralized trades, of which interbank transactions are the primary example. The industry standard, however, seems to be moving towards RIS even for uncollateralized trades. It is important to note that the primary objective here is to ensure that the same curves are used for valuing the actual and the hypothetical derivatives in a way that is consistent with market practice. But the last follow-up question is whether the same is true for fair value hedges. Our view is yes. When setting up the risk-free coupon rate of the hedge item, the contractual coupons could be discounted off the OIS curve or the LIBOR curve depending on the collateralization agreement of the hedge. When designating fair value risk due to interest rate movements, a proxy interest rate curve should be identified and documented. The proxy curve could be interest rates represented by the OIS curve or the LIBOR curve. It would make sense to identify the OIS curve as a proxy interest rate curve for fair value movements under a collateralized hedge and the LIBOR curve under an uncollateralized hedge. Again, we do note, however, that the industry standard seems to be moving towards OIS even for uncollateralized trades. And the last part of today's presentation uh, is risk factors and requirements for calculating XVA. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can try to do this using uh, simplified calculation. Uh, also, I mentioned that um, uh, the first kind of CVA was uh, the difference between riskless bond and uh, risky bond, when basically the difference can be calculated as, um, uh, or risky bond can be calculated as uh, cash flows, receivables, discounted at LIBOR plus 
uh, some spread, uh, but it's only uh, this type of calculation, this type of accounting works only for receivables. Um, I'll show an example where that uh, for interest rate swaps that uh, won't really work. You need really uh, the full revaluation Monte Carlo. At each point in time, uh, you have to um, simulate uh, market factors and based on these market factors uh, you have to uh, find uh, exposures and uh, potential future exposures uh, for uh, economic capital for example. Uh, for interest rate swap, um, uh, graph shows paths, these are path valuation paths for 10 year 100 million at the money swap uh, with volatility 25%. So uh, value starts at zero because it's at the money swap and in 10 years it goes to zero because uh, swap uh, is at uh, maturity. But in the middle uh, valuation can be differ from zero and uh, that's what uh, this uh, discounting um, at um, uh, receivables uh, method of discounting at uh, LIBOR plus some um, credit spread won't work here because uh, it will show zeros uh, while uh, you see that because of volatility many paths are non-zero. And volatility is really important uh, factor here uh, though for swap price volatility is not part of uh, of price of uh, valuation process and risk process, uh, exposures uh, of um, uh, interest rate swap really depend on volatility. Uh, so here is the graph of uh, two exposures, one at 25% and another is 50%. And one can see that uh, with doubling uh, volatility because it's um, uh, at the money trade um, and it stays at the money all the time, exposure uh, uh, doubles, uh, exactly doubles. So uh, knowing volatility in the market and calibrating uh, your models to volatility is extremely important. Um, hedging XVA, uh, that's uh, part of the, what XVA desks are doing and um, as I said we see uh, the process of consolidating uh, different desks and uh, even kind of uh, treasury uh, departments into uh, one department which deals with hedging and with uh, funding or the uh, valuation adjustment. Um, to mitigate CVA volatility as well as hedge default risks, uh, banks buy CDS protection on their counterparties and uh, of course now it's uh, harder to do with individual uh, CDSs, uh, more often it's done with credit indices. Uh, but uh, hedging DVA is um, even uh, uh, more complicated, more challenging than CVA because uh, here you have to hedge your own default risk and um, of course you cannot sell CDS protection on themselves so uh, banks often sell protection on highly correlated institutions, other banks, but this policy backfired uh, back in 2008 when Lehman was part of uh, these baskets of, of similar credits uh, for many banks. Uh, some other strategy involved buying the bank's own bonds but uh, that's also can be limited. Um, as I mentioned, introduction of XVA desks helps in uh, mitigating uh, volatility because now banks uh, can combine FVA and DVA, thus offsetting some volatility of earnings due to on credit spread moves. Uh, in addition to credit risk, uh, XVA depends on market factors uh, which affect rates in the portfolio such as interest rate, effects rates, equities and so on. Uh, hedged market risk is an important responsibility of uh, cross VA desks. And to calculate hedges you have to use the same uh, cross VA Monte Carlo model uh, as you do for uh, calculating CVA. Uh, the most uh, popular method of calculating hedging is just by bumping uh, uh, market factors, input factors and recalc. Uh, what are the requirements for counterparty risk agents so you can um, run all this analysis in, uh, including hedges? It should be scalable high performance Monte Carlo agent uh, that supports best market practices. Uh, it should be able to calculate all major counterparty risk measures and regulatory charges, ICVA, DVA, FVA, PFE. Uh, regulatory and uh, economical capital. It should be able to calculate um, efficiently first and second order sensitivity including very important cross gammas which are sensitivity of um, 
of market factors uh, due to uh, uh, due to change in uh, credit spread. Um, Advanced modeling of counterparty credit risk includes uh, calibration to market observable or to historical data. Uh, you should be able to capture full effects of netting agreements and collateral. Uh, you should be able to perform comprehensive wrong way risk analysis. Um, also, it should include American Monte Carlo capability, uh, which is necessary for exotic trades where valuation itself involves uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, that allows you to avoid uh, kind of Monte Carlo inside Monte Carlo, which uh, will be extremely slow. Uh, very important uh, functions are integrated pre-trade analysis, also called, uh, called incremental CVA, and also per trade attribution, uh, which is marginal CVA. And uh, important that uh, this Monte Carlo is accurate and consistent with front office pricing models. Uh, so, to conclude, uh, IFRS 13 defines fair value as an exit price. It requires the consideration of counterparty credit risk, CVA, and non-performance risk, DVA. Uh, CVA and DVA cannot be ignored when performing hedge effectiveness testing, but by carefully setting up the hypothetical derivative for cash flow hedges, spurious and effectiveness can be reduced. FVA is the new valuation adjustment, but it becomes integral part of XVA. Uh, FVA components FCA and FBA should be calculated with their own borrowing cost lending spread, respectively. Calculating XVAs and sensitivity is necessary, uh, and uh, to do this properly, you have to run full reval Monte Carlo model. Risk factors such as volatilities become very important for XVA evaluation, even if they are not part of trade valuation. And thank you very much, and uh, let us now uh, pause for uh, questions. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions now. Uh, one is, uh, buying owned bonds would result in the recognition of the bank's bond liability and couldn't be separately accounted uh, for in a trading portfolio, would it not? Uh, yeah, uh, I mentioned already that uh, buying bonds is uh, not ideal, uh, that uh, bonds were issued uh, for some reasons uh, and uh, for uh, capitalization of the company. Uh, so uh, buying your own bonds can uh, help with DVA uh, a little bit, but it definitely cannot be uh, used as a kind of uh, overall uh, policy. And uh, new policy of uh, uh, combining DVA and FVA uh, is basically uh, much more effective. Um, and uh, there is uh, another question, which uh, probably uh, also for me, um, what are best practices for estimating volatility? Um, uh, here you can look at, uh, first of all, at uh, market volatilities. You can uh, try to imply uh, volatility, input volatility for your uh, model from, um, uh, say, swaptions, uh, cap floors, so this is for interest rates, um, for um, FX options and so on, uh, but often uh, it's uh, uh, not available, this information, so then uh, using historical uh, volatility is uh, appropriate as well. Uh, uh, maybe mm -hmm. another question I think I'll take is, can you use the hyperderivative method for fair value hedges? So you know, it's, it's not often used. The hypothetical derivative method is, is almost exclusively used for, for fair value hedges. However, one can get to the exact same answer by using a hypothetical derivative on some fair value hedges. So mechanically, it is possible to get the, the, the same answer. Uh, but I would probably advise against it and, and use hypothetical derivatives for uh, cash flow hedges, predominantly for cash flow hedges. Um, but that does not say that the accounting standards are not very clear and doesn't exactly say that you are not allowed to use a hypothetical derivative method for fair value hedges, but I would, I would not advise it. Okay. Another question, which I think perhaps is for me, is when you speak of RS, is there an observable curve for South Africa? And basically at this stage, there isn't really an observable RS curve, although I think there are some moves to try and create an observable RS curve, but that still seems to be some time away. 
what we've noticed is that, that there are some places which will um, just use the standard three-month Jabal curve, um, and other places try and create some sort of an OIS proxy. Um, there's a number of ways one can go about doing that, one of which is to use your cross-currency basis swaps and do a global curve bootstrapping algorithm to try and back out an implied um, SAIS curve. Uh, okay, uh, there is a question for me. If I issue a bond with an embedded option, should I compute and report the CVA and DVA of the option? Is there only DVA? Uh, uh, basically, when we talk about bonds, we talk, don't talk really about CVA, DVA, because uh, it's already included in price, the price of uh, credit risk. But if we kind of translate this in CVA, DVA um, uh, language, uh, yes, there is only DVA. Uh, because um, there is no kind of uh, possibility that uh, somebody else uh, defaults on um, and you uh, lose. The only loss is to the uh, counterparty which buys this uh, bond. So there is DVA and this DVA should include option because if you default on your bond then you default on uh, bond and embedded option together. So yeah, so uh, this option should be included in DVA. Maybe one more question um, that was asked, what is the system approach for the hypothetical portfolio of swaps? So not 100% sure I understand the question, but effectively, you know, any, any system that can create uh, or solve for the fixed rate of, of, of a derivative or the spread or, or, the, or the pricing element of a derivative such that the derivative is uh, worth zero, any system that can handle that uh, could be used to set up a hypothetical derivative and in practice it varies from Excel based uh, models to front office trading systems where one can book uh, and create such a hypothetical portfolio of swaps. One more question. When you calculate FV, what kind of netting uh, you are using? Is it the same as CVA and DVA? Uh, no, uh, for CVA and DVA we use uh, netting with the counterparty and uh, with, uh, for FV uh, because of rehypothecation. Uh, you can uh, basically move your uh, funds in your uh, hedge portfolio, so if uh, some trade, hedge trade create positive cash flow, you can kind of uh, move it uh, to the, or you can pay margin costs and so on. So basically you have to net uh, the whole hedge portfolio across the whole counterparties and so on. So yes, in this case it will be different than uh, CVA, DVA, netting sets. Do we have... Uh, okay, maybe uh, at this point we have to wrap it up and uh, we will answer all other questions uh, if there are after the webinar. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.